being born in 1995, I was born at pretty much just the right time to see polygonal 3D games become the de facto standard for video games. That's not to say 2D was completely eliminated by that point. Indeed, plenty of 2D games were still being released during the 1990s. As the 90s rolled on, racing games were coming out a dime a dozen in 3D, with one of the first being Virtua Racer by Sega, before going on to make Daytona USA, Indy 500, Sega Rally Championship, and Scud Race, and so on. It would be fair to say Sega ruled the arcade racing market. However, it would also be fair to say that there was another force standing in waiting to showcase their own attempts at breaking into the arcade racing scene, and in doing so, brought about one of the longer-lasting arcade racing franchises for quite some time. In 1993, in Japanese and American arcades, was released an arcade game called Ridge Racer. Developed by Namco on their System 22 board, it was designed to propel racing games forward from Virtual Racer, which came before it. It was such an arcade hit that two extra variants of it were built. One called Ridge Racer Full Scale, where you sat inside a Mazda MX-5 to control the game, which is projected onto a very wide screen, and another called Ridge Racer Free Screen Edition, where you have three displays lined up to provide you with some peripheral vision. Namco had done something similar a few years prior with its limited release Driver's Eyes, released in 1991 and on the earlier Namco System 21 board. In 1994, an arcade sequel was developed to Ridge Racer called Ridge Racer 2, with the primary difference being support for multiplayer between 2 to 8 players. Besides that, new music tracks and billboards advertising Namco's other games, it served more as an update than it did as a sequel. Later on that year, Sony was about to release its games console, the PlayStation, and a port of Ridge Racer would soon release on the PlayStation as a launch title across the world. In Japan, the game was released alongside such games as Crime Crackers and A4 Evolution. North America would see the game release alongside the likes of Rayman and Street Fighter the movie, with Europe getting it alongside Jumping Flash and Wipeout. Ridge Racer is a constant as far as launch lineups are concerned, with all regions having the game on launch for the system. So why don't we take a look back to see how things have shaped in the last 25 years. The version I will be reviewing for the purposes of this review, and for all future reviews for this uh, kind of series, will be the Japanese release. So let's have a look at this. The packaging for Ridge Racer is somewhat representative of the game itself. The front of this dual case shows the road on which you will be racing, the cars you will be put up against, and other aspects of the environment paired up with the logo for the game. You can tell this is quite old, because Namco is spelt with a T, although reading upon Wikipedia suggests that Namco used the Namco branding for porting arcade titles to other platforms. Hmm, who remembers this arcade classic? The back of the case has a lot of stuff I can't really read with the lack of a translator. You see, whilst I collect Japanese imports, I'm not exactly an expert on the language. I can read Kana just fine, but most kanji's guesswork and, for me, sentence structure and grammar is, well, uh, wakarimasen. According to Google, combined with the use of jisho.org and my own sensibilities, the bit below the logo translates to the thrill of driving flat out is in your hands, or something to that effect, which certainly makes sense. The rest, though, oh god. Google says, Flowing sound, beautiful scenery, the super realistic screen of Ridge Racer is faithfully reproduced on PlayStation. An exhilarating drive that runs at full speed in a familiar town. This is the ultimate racing game that signals a new era. Well, it makes more sense than Google Translate usually does. Perhaps someone ran it through already? There's also some screenshots on the back of the case, showing us some racing in different times of day. Aside from that though, it doesn't really tell us anything we can't already infer from the front of the box. Let's look in the manual. It shows us the layout of the courses we'll be navigating, and shows us that the game supports the Namco Nejicon. So not only is it a first PlayStation game, but it also has support for other controllers. Neat! Aside from that, it's your usual manual affair, screenshots combined with descriptions for most things in the game, all printed onto a few slits of paper combined with some safety messages and adverts for Namco's other offerings, although they weren't available on PlayStation when the game came out, so... Uh. Anyway, it's time that we booted this thing up and see what was what. Um, wait. This is Galaxian. Why am I playing Galaxian? 
Ah, uh, yeah. This is more like it. This is the menu, and all of a sudden someone who learned to play bass guitar from Les Claypool decides to slap some beats while someone else shouts in the background. The menu is quite simple. You have the course setting, a setting between automatic and manual transmissions, a selection of cars, and a selection of music. There's some other settings here, but let's not worry about that for now and jump right in. Whoa, hey, get out the way, race queen! The race is about to start! Okay, she's out the way now. The first thing you'll notice is the starting procedure. Rev your engine, but don't overread it to the red zone, lest you end up spinning your wheels at the start. This is a feature that many racing games of the time would feature. The next thing that I notice personally is how tricky the controls are to get to grips with. In recent times I've been playing games such as the earlier Gran Turismo games, and even though they were released years later, at no point would I say I had any issue with their controls. Still, I got used to these after a while. The game is also played from a first person's perspective, but there is also a chase camera option if you want to look at your car seemingly going a straight line, but actually look as if it's going for a drunken stupor. Uh, yeah, I'm sticking with first person, thank you very much. Now, there are four different cars in the main game. Car 3 is an all-rounder with good handling, grip, acceleration and speed. Car 4 is more focused towards grip and handling while sacrificing straight line speed, which is my personal way to go. Car 2 is an exercise in hilarity by focusing on acceleration at the expense of any handling characteristics. And Car 12 has a little less acceleration, but a hell of a lot of speed and a little bit more grip. Now, there's a good reason as to why I select car number 4 as my primary, and that is because this game likes to be really weird with its handling. Letting off the throttle can send you into a drift, which seems like a cool feature, but I'll touch on this later on though. I make sure I don't have to worry about drifting by selecting car number 4, however, because you can basically take the entire course for all intents and purposes flat. Just pretend you're driving at a speedway like Indianapolis and you're golden with this thing. Yes, it's slower in a straight line, but I don't need to worry about hitting top speed when I'm basically doing it out of the corner. I guess what I'm trying to say is, whilst there is a definite preference in terms of what a player might want to drive and can get the most out of, I feel like Car 4 is very much favoured on the basis that it makes navigating the twistier parts of the course all the more easy. In fact, come the later track settings, you'll be glad that you are using it. There are four track settings, Beginner, Intermediate, Advanced and Time Trial. Each course has an increase to the general speed of each car, going from a meagre 160km per hour to a decidedly more brisk 220km per hour. The beginner course consists of two laps, whilst the others consist of three laps, and whilst beginner and intermediate take place around the shorter circuit, advanced and time trial breaks off from the near end of the lap to its own twisty section before rejoining on the home straight. It's a very tricky part of the circuit, and I have to commend Namco for how they've designed it, because it's not only quite a memorable layout, but it's also surprisingly tricky to master to get the quickest times. The narrow walls also make for a feeling of claustrophobia, like you're driving the mountain section of Mount Panorama, or basically any part of Monaco. There is, however, one crucial thing that I am not a fan of. It being an arcade racer, it's not unlikely that you will hit something like a wall or another car, and you will absolutely hemorrhage speed. If you make a relatively gentle scrape or tap against a wall or another car, your speed is going bye-bye something fierce. Now, it's not unreasonable to expect that speed would be reduced for hitting something, that's just physics at play, but losing a massive chunk at speed for what would ordinarily only brush a few kilometres per hour off? Yeah, I am by no means a fan of that, it just feels needlessly cruel. Let's talk about the visuals, because they are quite a key part of the game in a way. The game runs natively at 30 frames per second with pretty much no slip-ups, although in one of the later races I did encounter some very occasional hitches, but it's otherwise perfectly smooth. It also runs with no resolution switching, which is most appreciated. It does run at a lower resolution and a lower frame rate than its arcade counterpart, which is played at a resolution of 640x480 at 60 frames per second, but as far as arcade conversions go, it's quite solid. In terms of general graphics for an early PS1 game, it 
looks all right. There is some funkiness in that you can sometimes see some mesh seams, as evidenced by random blue pixels on the screen, but on the whole it's visually pretty alright for a PS1 game of the time. It's probably the best looking launch title on the PS1, although Wipeout arguably has that beat. This is an audio-visual medium, so it makes sense to bring up the audio side of things as well. The game primarily features six music tracks, not counting those outside of the racing itself, all composed by Shinji Hosoe, Ayako Saso, and Nobuyoshi Sano. These six tracks are varied in style, all being some sort of play on electronica. They did throw in a GABA song called Rotterdam Nation, and it can get in your head a little too easily, and the results music sampling Kraftwerk's Boing Boom Shack is a little bit odd, but alright. And I swear, the song Ridge Racer sounds like it belongs in something like Mario Kart 64. The audio design outside of the music is generally alright for what it is. The engine revs increase in pitch as they do in number, the cars make tyre screeching sounds as you drift, and as you hit something that makes a clonk noise, it does the job it needs to do. The announcer guy is perhaps a little bit too enthused about his job, however, especially as whenever you take a corner pretty quickly, he basically screams at the top of his lungs that you have to teach him how to drive. He does this a little bit too much and it gets overbearing with this sort of thing, to a point where it starts to sound patronising. Anyway, since this is the Japanese version of the game and since these reviews are intended to go into whether these are import friendly, I can safely say that this game has such little Japanese in it that you won't need to worry about it if you are like me and have a limited grasp of the language. Almost all of the menu is in English, with only one item not being in English, and that being the core select. Although you can easily defer from context, and even refer to the instruction manual, as it mentions the core selections with their English and Japanese names. Aside from that, the player isn't expected to understand any Japanese to be able to play this game. If you're an importer and want to get a copy of this game but don't really know the language, then you are reasonably safe with this game, I would say. As for content, I think I ought to mention something about this game. It being an arcade port alone wouldn't really be enough to justify the purchase of the game, or at least not for the price it was sold at. Granted, CDs were a burgeoning format in the gaming space, owing to their ability to hold more content more cheaply than cartridge-based solutions at the time like the Nintendo 64, so there was possibly a case to be made for such expense. In any event, I mentioned all of the face content already. There are four courses, there are four cars, and you've got all that to play with. Except there is more. Once you beat the time trial, you can unlock extra versions of the tracks that you had already raced on. That is to say, you can now race these tracks in reverse. Gran Turismo largely fetishizes this concept, but in this game, you can drive the tracks in the opposite direction to what you already did. There is even a mirror mode, which you can activate by leaving the start line, turning around just as you get to the main track, drive back around to the start line, and drive into the wall Harry Potter style, and you'll enable a complete mirror image of the track. It's a funky addition, to be sure. Now, the extra content in concept is fine. It's a cheap way to bulk out the content, for sure, but it's something to do, at least, so I can't really complain on that front. However, what I can complain about is how much of a pain the extra content is to beat. I'm not really a fan of games that suddenly pile on the difficulty for no discernible reason. Yes, I get that this is extra content that by its own nature will be harder than what I'd done prior to this point, but out of the five and a bit hours that I put into this game, I spent almost two hours trying to be intermediate extra. This included me trying to understand how drifting really worked. So as you approach a corner, lift off the throttle, and as you begin the turn, apply the throttle again to initiate the drift. And once you've done, come back in. Seems simple enough, but maybe I'm just used to the way that you drift in something like OutRun 2, where you stab the brakes and then the throttle to initiate the slide. I know it's not exactly realistic, but it's what I grew up with, and I'm far more accustomed to that than whatever this is doing. 
It also feels like the drifting is really inconsistent at times. Sometimes it will initiate, as I expect, but other times it does not, and sometimes to my benefit, but more often not, to a point where I sometimes initiate a drift, but somehow go in the wrong direction with it. It's a bit weird to me that something that is the point of the game becomes all the more difficult to manage. The extra content ate up a total of over four hours for me. Ironically, the time trial extra was the easiest for me because after the gauntlet that was the rest of the extra content, I managed to deal with the time trial extra in about 15 minutes. Still a fair chunk of time, but nowhere near as egregious as before. I'm conflicted on how I feel about achieving all of this. On one hand, I feel a decent sense of accomplishment knowing that I've beaten this game effectively 100%. On the other hand, however, I can't help but be bewildered about the amount of time that it took to do it for the amount of content the game has. It took me an hour to beat the base game content, and now another four hours to beat the bonus content. Sometimes I wonder if the bonus content had been better off being a part of the base content instead. There is also a matter of the cars. You know that Galaxian load-in game? Well, there is a reason as to why that's there. No, it's not simply there to justify patenting the idea of games within loading screens, even though they had been present on games on the Commodore 64 for a decade prior up to this point. Thanks, Namco. Whilst it does serve a purpose in making loading the game seem like less of a pain, it also serves as a little challenge, as if you can beat that, you can unlock the full roster of 12 cars. Each car has its own unique characteristics, although personally I never found much of a reason to go for any of them. None of them are quite as grippy as the number four, and whilst they are still perfectly fine to drive, I'm going to stick to what I know. There is, however, a rather spooky 13th car. By beating the Esther time trial, where there is a third car, you can unlock the number 13, 13th racing car. Its specifications trump anything you've driven up to now, to a point where the grip and handling are literally off the chart. So, surely I can be fast in a straight line and in the corners of this thing, right? Let's give it a go and give it a try. Oh well, guess I'm just bad. And there we have it. This is all of the content that Ridge Racer offers up. For what it is, it's not terrible. It's, it is an arcade port, and a pretty accurate one at that, but you'd be forgiven for expecting a little bit more than what is on offer. It's certainly a respectable showcase of what the PlayStation was capable of in the system's early years. However, that's only really if you lived in Japan as Europe and America already had games coming out that showcased the abilities of the system much better, such as with games like Rayman and Wipeout. On the whole, would I recommend this game? Yes, I think I would. Even when I was struggling and angrily shouting at the game during the Intermediate Extra mission, <laughs> I was on the whole still enjoying it because I was willingly really playing it at the end of the day. I wouldn't say I disliked the game purely because of that moment, although it was a contributor in my qualifying remarks of the game. Is it worth importing, though? Well, I guess that's a tricky question to answer, because I wouldn't really aim for acquiring a copy of this unless you happen to acquire it at a retro game fair or something, or something pretty cheap online. Or if you're a collector of everything PlayStation, but you probably have this already. You needn't worry about the language barrier with this game, however. There's only really one option in the main menu where Japanese features, and it's not really a lot of it, and you can defer from context. Or you can refer to the manual, where it has it in English as well. Everything else is in reasonably plain English. Which leaves the next question, which version of the game is worth getting? You see, this isn't the only version of the game on PlayStation. In 1998, Namco released its fourth game in the series on PlayStation, called Ridge Racer Type 4. And it includes a bonus disc. On the bonus disc, in the Japanese version at least, is a version of Ridge Racer that runs at 60 frames per second, called Ridge Racer High Spec Version. 
It contains slightly updated visuals, giving cars grow shading, and it looks kind of similar to how Ridge Racer Type 4 does. The game runs in 60 frames per second and contains a similar span of content to the original game, although you basically only race against one other car, and you only have two different modes per track. Time Trial, where you race against another car, and Time Attack, racing against the clock. Perhaps my asking of the question of which version is worth getting was a little weird, because really it's not the same game at all. And it's most distilled it is, but you're having to make quite a few simplifications for that. So if you want the true Ridge Racer experience, the original game is clearly the way to go. The high spec version is cool for what it is, and it's a cool little thing to try out, but it's ultimately a bonus to what is in my opinion at least, the best game in the series on the PlayStation 1. And as for the franchise itself, well, I think we know where it all went. It rocked the PlayStation with three more games, a fifth as a launch title for the PlayStation 2, a sixth for the Xbox 360, oddly, a seventh for the PlayStation 3, and a few other games. Ridge Racer also released on the Nintendo 64 as a mix of the first game and Revolution and it got a DS port some years later down the line. There were also two PlayStation Portable games, serving a similar purpose to Ridge Racer 64, with Ridge Racer 3D for the Nintendo 3DS, and Ridge Racer PlayStation Vita releasing for the launches of those systems. The most recent game in the series was released in 2012 as Ridge Racer Unbounded, taking cues more from Burnout and Twisted Metal insofar as being more combat oriented. Whilst Namco haven't released any newer games since then, the series still remains well regarded by fans of the arcade racing genre, and hopefully a new game could be released in a few years time after the series has long since passed its 25 years in arcades. I have been Daniel Learmouth, and now that I've reviewed and finished the first PlayStation game to be released, I can safely say there's a long road ahead for me for where I can go as far as these imports are concerned. Which reminds me, for the time being, I only really have the use of an OSSC scan converter if I want to make these games look good in combination with an Elgato HD60S capture device. At some point I'm looking towards getting a Frame Meister, or something similar to it, should the opportunity arise so that I can cover games from other systems. For now, however, I will focus on the PlayStation, as the PlayStation 2 looks very ugly for an OSSC, and as for Super Famicom, uh, it, it doesn't work. Now, I do have this cheapo HD upscaler thing, but it's not really going to make the games look good, is it? I'll have to get a Frame Meister at some point, but for now, PS1 it is. That's it for now. I know what I'll be covering in the next episode, and it involves mechs. But for now, if there's any games you would like to see covered on here, I will do what I can to cover them. This has been Daniel Learmouth. Salute.